My name is Emanuele Lugli. I'm a professor of art history at Stanford University in California in the United States. And today I'll be speaking to you about uh, the medieval cities uh, of Dante and how he experienced them and how he wrote about them in his most famous poem, The Divine Comedy. So today I would like uh, to speak to you about uh, the cities that Dante encountered during his lifetime. And uh, as a way to start, I would like to enter the Cathedral of Fort Florence. The building that you see today is not what Dante experienced. Um, the cathedral actually had a slightly different name. It was in a slightly different position. This is the cathedral that started when um, Dante was in, in his mid thirties and it was expanded over the century. And for instance, the dome was added was added after Dante's death by an architect called Filippo Brunelleschi. The facade was um, added in the 19th century because a cathedral of this size was so large that it wasn't finished, you know, during the Renaissance. But the reason why I want to start talking about a cathedral that Dante has never seen is because inside the cathedral, there is a, a wonderful painting that uh, serves uh, as an excellent weight of introduction. In this picture, painted by Domenico di Michelino, you see Dante standing with a copy of his masterpiece, The Divine Comedy. And all around him is uh, the setting of his poem. As you may know, The Divine Comedy is uh, um, journey into the afterlife. And it's divided into three cantiche or groups of chapters, which are called cantos in the case of the Divine Comedy. And on the left, you find hell with the devils uh, and the damned, the people who sinned in life uh, and therefore they condemned to eternal punishment. And on the back, uh, you find uh, the skies of heavens uh, where each band represents uh, a planet, the orbit of a planet and the Dante journeys through them levitating, accompanied by Beatrice, you know, his muse and uh, chaperone, eventually to um, get uh, uh, sight of the Virgin Mary and God. This representation is very much inspired by medieval cosmologies, where you can see in, uh, on the right, this is taken from a manuscript that represents the universe. In the center, there is the earth that is represented as a T. It's a T because the, the world was thought as made of only three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, which were crossed by the seas and the oceans that we know today. There was no knowledge, let's say, at least in Europe, of the um, of the Americas, right? And all around that you find the representations of, of the skies. You find, for instance, you can read the second circles, you can read Mercurius, which is the planet of Mercury. Then you find the red circle, it says Sol, which in Latin means the sun. Then you find Mars, up to Saturnus, which was considered to be the latest planet. So the cosmology of Dante is very much inspired by what he was reading in manuscripts. Today, however, we tend to represent the journey of the divine comedy in a different way. That's what you usually find when you open a modern version of the divine comedy. You find that Dante starts his journey in Jerusalem, right? And from there he enters hell. After that, the hell is basically a sort of funnel and uh, it's uh, like the pressions, the sinking into the ground. And Dante in his journey is kind of spiraling down until the very end of it, where he's gonna encounter Lucifer. And through that, through this passage, he's gonna enter purgatory, which is exactly a copy uh, of hell, but something that expands outside of the earth as, um, as a mountain. 
And then from that, Dante continues his journeys towards his paradise, and especially the Empyrean, that is this white rose where, um, that is inhabited by Christ and the Virgin Mary. So you can see, we today we see these representations as um, this, this like crashing going as linearly going from one point to the next. But that's not how 15th century Renaissance Florentines imagine it. And the peculiarity of this uh, painting is that it's not just a representation of the afterworld. Half of the picture is dedicated to the city of Florence because Dante spoke extensively about it. You can find it uh, uh, some of its landmarks, for instance, we have already seen the dome designed by Filippo Brunelleschi that Dante would not have encountered, which gives you a sense that uh, the painting that you see, it's anachronistic. And there's another building that Dante would not have been able to see, but it has been included, which is represented by this bell tower here. And this is the city hall of Florence, the famous Palazzo della Signoria, that was begun in 1299 when Dante worked as a politician and for the city of Florence. Dante had a brief spell as a politician in the uh, late um, of the 1290s, right? Uh, um, that's not how he made most of his monies. It was probably like a landowner. And uh, most importantly, he made money through his uh, poetry and uh, his uh, writing and rhetorical skills. So the two buildings that we've just seen um, constituted the, the two political centers of Florence. All medieval cities in Italy are structured around two centers of powers, not one. So on the top, you find the cathedral, right? Which is next to the bishopric where the bishop, bishop lives and where the canons live. And this represents the ecclesiastical power in um, the city of Florence. And on the other side, you find the city hall of the Palazzo della Signoria. The Florence of Dante was much smaller than it is today. And if you can look closely, you can still see all around it some thick lines that gives you a sense of the streets. They're still today particularly wider. And they correspond to the medieval city walls. And these were built in 1175, that is almost like a century before Dante was born. So at that point, thanks to like a massive demographic expansion, the city has already passed over them and started expanding outside so that this, um, the city of Florence required a new city walls that were built in the 14th century, which more or less correspond to um, the city center of the city today. There are some other important elements that you encounter in any medieval city that Dante visited. For instance, an important pole is the commercial center, which is the market, which today in Florence has been turned into a square that happened in the 19th century. But that time was a bustling market. You know, sellers would bring vegetables and poultry and cattle every day in and out from one of the gates outside of the cities. And then the space had to be cleared out every evening to be washed and all the material and all the merchandise had to be pushed out of the city again. So you have to imagine there's a constant, you know, traffic of people coming in and leaving and right in the center. So as you can see, these sites are extremely close to one another. You can walk between them. It takes maybe five minutes to walk from the cathedral to the city hall and less than two to go to the market square. Florence at the time was an incredibly dense city. You can get a sense by how closely knit the urban blocks are. People were living on the top of shops, and not dissimilarly from Hong Kong, you get a sense of concentrations that made the city such an important economic, economic power in Europe at the time. Dante lived right in the middle of it. We don't know exactly where he lived, but thanks to a lot of research of historians since the 18th century, we're um, capable of understanding at least the urban block where Dante must have lived. Now, today, if you go to Florence, this is identified as a specific um, 
how the Ba'ites are unclear if he really lived there, but it's likely they lived in, in the block or in the surroundings. Uh, another important building in the life of Dante was the baptistry. The baptistry is a monumental building that was open just in certain circumstances uh, and served for baptizing the Florentines. Um, to be baptized meant to enter the Christian community of Florence, but uh, it's very difficult to separate uh, religious uh, rights uh, and uh, political rights. Uh, at the time, everything was enmeshed. And so therefore, you know, to be baptized also meant to be recognized as a citizen of Florence. The baptistry was perhaps uh, one of the most lavishly decorated buildings in Florence. And as you can see, it's completely clad in marble panels, you find stone columns all around. And, but this is empty today. In Dante's time, you have to imagine it as having a big octagonal font, which you can still discern, you know, from the marks on the floor, and which is uh, this sort of big bathtub where people were baptized. And Dante actually writes about this in the Divine Comedy. Is uh, um, we hear in. Inferno 19, which is the 19th chapter or canto of hell. And this, um, and this canto is dedicated to the so-called third bolgia or the third layer of hell. There you find the sinners that are punished because of simony. It's a chapter that is dedicated to an indictment of the church, where Dante accuses the clerical establishment of avarice. And, uh, you know, priests were corrupted, people were taking money in order to uh, take away sins from sinners. There was uh, extreme leniencies towards them. So Dante, uh, who envisions um, the whole divine comedy as a way to reflect uh, on the goods and the bads of his uh, world, takes the occasions to criticize the church by referring to, you know, a building that became a symbol of the ecclesiastical establishment in its hometown of Florence. So I'm just gonna read um, some verses. So it's in the third bulge, right? And is, describing what's happening all around, uh, and he writes, along the sides and down along the bottom, I saw the livid rock was perforated. The openings were all one width and round. They did not seem to me less broad or more than those that in my handsome San Giovanni were made to serve as basins for baptizing. And one of these, not many years ago, I broke for someone who was drowning in it and let this be my sail to set men straight. So this is something that Dante does a lot. So he's describing an imaginary world, a fantasy world, right? But as a way to make people realize what hell must have looked like, he makes references to things that people could have seen in their daily life, right? Remember the books in medieval times, the time of Dante, that had no illustration. So you only had to rely on the evocative power of the word in order to create this fantasy world. So he's talking about how he finds his holes in hell and as a way to give you a sense of how people come out of it, He's thinking about the baptismal font in the middle of um, San Giovanni, the baptistry of Florence. Now, the baptismal font is gone, but to get an away of what it must look like, we can move to the nearby city of Pisa, where you can find an intact medieval baptismal font made by Guido Bicarelli. As you can see, it's octagonal, it's in the center. You have to imagine this kind of like filled with water, 
Dante speaks that there were lots of basins, so perhaps the one in Florence was even more complicated. But this gives you a sense of the height. You know, there was probably a few steps that allowed um, people to get into the font, which was being filled with water, and then emerge as if you were like a swimming pool. The um, baptistry in Florence, however, was important for another reason. If you look up, you're going to see a dome completely covered in mosaics. It's one of the most beautiful mosaics of, the medi of medieval Europe. And there you find uh, some extremely interesting stories that Dante certainly would have seen. It's uh, the whole dome is structured around a spiral. It starts here, where you can see the creations of the world by God, and then it continues, you can see on the right, the creations of Adam, the creation of Adam and Eve, and on. So it follows this kind of spiral movement, which is also what Dante uh, follows when journeying down hell and on the top of the mountains of purgatory. So just let's say the kind of visual compositions of the scenes could have uh, stimulated Dante to create uh, um, to create a space uh, um, he imagined in Divine Comedy. But there, in the, on the Baptistry Dome, you also find the representations of the Last Judgment. There's this towering Christ that is uh, sitting on a rainbow, that is judges humankind, dividing them in between the blessed, uh, those people that will go to the paradise, and the sinners that will go in hell, which you can see represented on the right of these pictures. Some of them are being eaten by this devilish figure that is Lucifer. It has three heads. And all around them, there are these naked figures. They are tormented by demons. This is also how Dante imagines hell most of the time. The city of Florence, however, was inspirational for Dante for other reasons. There were two major learning centers in Florence. One was represented by the monastery of the Franciscan that is called the Church of Santa Croce. You can see here the facade, which has also been added in the 19th century, but I'm showing you here because on the left, you can find a statue of Dante uh, that, is, uh, that is commemorating his uh, uh, literary greatness. And Dante is not buried in Florence, as we will see later, but in the uh, city of Ravenna, where he died. The reason why I'm showing you is that this church was not just a church. You didn't go just there to go to mass. And next to it, there was an important monastery where many um, sons of important Florentine families spend their lives. If uh, the eldest son did not inherit, so, so let me say it again. Usually it was only the eldest son that inherited the estate of a wealthy family. So the other sons had the possibilities to join a monastery um, or a religious order, such as the Franciscans in this case. This was in no way like a secondary choice. Um, being part of a convent was actually um, a good life choice. Uh, you know, it provided you with food, with uh, um, and especially it provided you with uh, a, a place to sleep, but also it provided you with an occasion to learn and educate yourself. All these uh, centers came with an uh, incredible library and, uh, and they were itself a cultural center for the productions of knowledge. But the reason why I'm entering is that because inside of it, there's a crucifix that Dante is talking about. This was made by the renowned master Cimabue. And unfortunately, it got badly damaged in 1966 when Florence was flooded. But this was heralded as one of the most in innovational pieces made in 13th century. Florence, you know, when, you know, Dante was born in 1265, so it was like uh, probably five or ten years old when this was installed in the church. Just to give you a sense of the innovations of Cimabue, I'm comparing it with a previous uh, Romanesque cross that is today in Assisi. On the left, in the Romanesque cross, you see Christ with open eyes, uh, which is a way to represent the fact that Christ never really died because Christ was not uh, uh, just a man was also the son of God, and therefore he resurrected, right? And therefore he brought, he brought uh, according to the Christian thinking, like uh, life to everyone. 
But you can see the position is quite uh, stiff. He is uh, looking up at the heavens. He's surrounded by this figure that's squeezed within it, even if they were probably lying on, on the on the ground during the crucifixion. So this is an object, an image that tries to compress different moments of the crucifixions at once. Chimabue does not opt for this composition. Instead, it represents Christ in isolation. You can see that it's tried to give a sense of weight as if Christ has been nailed to the cross and therefore the weight is kind of like pulling forward, right? On the panels on the right and the left, you find the Virgin Marys and uh, Saint John the Evangelist, kind of mourning with you know the cheeks on their hand, you know the death of Christ. So Dante writes about this in the Divine Comedy in comparison to uh, another um, painter whose uh, um, cross is in another monastery in another center of knowledge. This time run by the Dominicans, and this is in house in the Church of Santa Maria Novella as you can see on the screen now. So when you enter the church, you still find the cross in what was likely to be the original position, even if churches at the time were very different. There, for instance, that this kind of broad screen that separated the space of the clergy from the space of the layman. But uh, you can see here how different it is uh, the quality of um, Giotto's cross is. And I invite you to take a closer look to really um, appreciate uh, um, the beautiful foreshortening, the shadowing um, of this cross. Looks, for instance, that the hands have been slightly rotated to give you a sense of three-dimensionality. Look, at, for instance, at the way the blood drips from the um, the feet of Christ, and it's kind of trickling on a rock, which represents the Mount of Golgotha, where Adam was buried. And that's what you find at the very bottom, the skull of Adam, with his jaw that is receiving the vivifying blood of Christ, which is a way to symbolize the fact that, thanks to his death, Christ has regenerated humankind, has brought a new life back, to humanity, representing this case, but Adam, the first man. But here, again, look up about these two crucifixes. They have been made only perhaps 20 years apart and how different the style is between them. The typology is more or less the same. Giotto must have known the cross of Cimabue, must have learned from it, and yet at the same time, he gives a different weight to the body, a different corporality. And this is this type of stylistic shift is what Dante is emphasizing in another passage of the Divine Comedy. Now, in this case, we are in Purgatory 11. This is the Terrace of Pride. So the Mount of Purgatory is divided between different terraces, right? And each of them is dedicated to yeah, people who have sinned in their life, but whose sins can be purged through a period of praying and expiations. So here, uh, Dante encounters people who have sinned because of their pride, and in particular encounters three typologies of sinners, people whose pride, who were proud because of their family, that is their lineage, people that were proud because of the power they accumulated, and finally he encounters a group of artists who, proud, who were proud because of their art. So Dante here is reflecting on the theme of vainglory, and he's using these two artists Cimabue, who was very famous in the 70s, and then Giotto, um, who became famous in the 1290s and 1300s, when Dante was in his, in his maturity, to reflect on how quickly the taste for art changes. So I'm reading these verses in English. O oh, empty glory of the powers of humans, how briefly green endures upon the peak, unless an age of dullness follows it. In painting Cimabue, thought he held the field, and now it's Giotto, they acclaim. The former only keeps a shadowed fame. I just want to emphasize two words in these verses. Dante is uh, 
a master of the world also because he's capable of lifting specific words from the experience of art and the artist and crafting verses around them. In this case, notice that he's talking about how Cimabue thought he held the field. The word in Italian is campo. And field, yes, it's the field like a battlefield, it's like a metaphorical field, but the field is also a partition in a painting. It's, it's a plane that you gonna paint on. So it's a technical term that the painters used at the time. And also notice that here Dante talks about the shifting of fame as a moment of shadowing, because that's exactly what made first Cimabue, but then Giotto, a great artist. They became masters of shadowing, of showing the three dimensionalities of the body. And in this way, they moved away from the 12th century cross that I showed you before, that was quite stiff, static, and felt like uh, um, quite flat. So, as I mentioned, Dante, in, at the end of the 1290s, takes part in the political life of Florence. He's uh, uh, giving multiple tasks. In particular, he works for a brief period as an ambassador, and he's sent uh, from Florence to Rome. And there in Rome, he gets to see, you know, the capital of the state of the church, uh, one of the most illustrious and lavish cities uh, in Europe. In particular, he uh, remains particularly impressed by the Cathedral of St. Peter's. It does not look like what you see today, which has been remade in the 16th century by various architects such as Bramante, Raphael, and Michelangelo. Today, it looks more what a basilica in the Middle Ages look like. It is a church with five naves on the back. You can find the plan on the right. And on the front, there is an atrium where you wash your hands, similar to a mosque today. And uh, it is in this courtyard that Dante encounters something quite spectacular. This is an enormous pine cone made out of bronze that belonged to the Temple of Isis in the Roman times. And it was so spectacular that it became a part of St. Peter's in medieval times. And for Dante, this enormous pine cone is very important when he goes towards the very end of hell in Inferno and he encounters there the giants. And uh, the giants are enormous creatures and Dante wants to convey the sense of their scale by using an object that for him was completely out of scale. It was like a pine cone has been totally sized up. And that's what he writes. Um, his face, the face of a giant, appeared to me as broad and long as Rome can claim for its St. Peter's pine cone. His other bones shared in the same proportion. Again, like in the case of the baptistry, Dante here is trying to use an object and most of people would have seen to convey the sense of something fantastical, something that can happen only in your mind. That, the, the atrium of St. Peter's, however, was marvelous, for instance. It's uh, in uh, that atrium that Giotto completed an, an enormous mosaic of, uh, dedicated to the Navicella, that is um, Christ telling St. Peter's, you can find them on the bottom right, that he needs to take control of the church after his death. And he tells him that uh, the journey of the church will be a rocky one. It will be like a ship in a storm moved in all directions. And he needs to steady the ship in order to make sure that the Catholic church will have a future. And that makes um, some references to the stormy, waters in which the church finds itself. They made a lot of scholars speculate that perhaps Dante would have seen also this mosaic, which is of an uncertain dating. But one thing that Dante certainly saw is the alien bridge that today is known as the Ponte Sant'Angelo, because it leads to the Castel Sant'Angelo, which was a prison before a mausoleum and so on. And it's famous because it's decorated by 
um, mannerist and baroque sculptures of angels holding the tools of the passions of Christ. But Dante would not have seen the angels. He would have only seen the bridge, which was one of the main bridges that crossed the Tiber River, but also allowed you to go to St. Peter's, which is just basically behind the mausoleum. And again, here, Dante, we are in hell. We're in Canto uh, 18. And uh, um, Dante is trying to describe the largest crowd that he has ever encountered, right? The Eighth Circle, which is where Dante is, is called Malebolge, and is one, is the is the one that Dante dedicates most of the divine, of, of the hell cantica, uh, of the divine comedy to. It's, uh, it's divided in 10 ditches, and the whole Malebolge is dedicated to fraudsters, to people who committed a sin of fraud. And that's why it's unusually crowded. Dante here is telling us that uh, fraud, in a certain way, is the most uh, common sins. Uh, so many people uh, are, are suffering because of it. And uh, so uh, Dante wants to give a sense of how crowded this canto is. And uh, as a way to talk about it, he's talking about how crowd this bridge was during the Jubilee of the year 1300, where most of pilgrims from, from all around the uh, Europe uh, went to Rome and uh, um, to visit St. Peter's. So that's what he writes. To our right, I saw a suffering new to me, new torments and new scourgers with whom the first ditch was replete. The sinners in its depth were naked. Those on our side of the center coming towards us, the others moving with us, but with longer strides. Just as because of the throngs were vast at the year of Jubilee, the Romans had to find a way to let the people pass across the bridge so that all those on one side faced the castle heading over to St. Peter's, these on the other heading towards the mount. So you have to imagine, again, this bridge packed with pilgrims going in both directions. And Dante again uses an image uh, that comes from real life as a way to convey something that happened in hell. The idea of the bridge is particularly clever because one of the peculiarity of the Malebolge, it is the eight circles of hell, is that it's uh, set in a built environment. Until then, we went through Dante's uh, journeys through forests and woods and deserts and fields, but now we've entered basically a city. So Dante is lifting an architectural element as a way to talk about the urbanity, the constructiveness of this circle. Dante is also, when he goes to Rome, he goes to see also a baptistry, and he, of the, this part today of the large Lateran complex. It's also one of the few features that remains from the original medieval buildings. The Lateran have been extensively redone over the centuries. And there, uh, he finds in this baptistry, again, something similar to what we find in the baptistry in Florence, a lavishly decorated building that belongs in part to um, Roman times, and uh, um, it's a splendid building, and Dante, who was amazed probably himself by this building, um, uses, he wants to describe this amazement, and he does so at the very end of the paradise, when Dante has crossed all the orbits of the planets and is entering the white rose of the Empyrean, is basically, this is the antechamber of his encounter with the Virgin Mary and Christ. So as a way to talk about the amazement for the surroundings, uh, in order to convey the sense of lightness and enchantment and sublimity that Dante encounters, he talks about, he imagines how, what the barbarians must have felt when they entered Rome just uh, before the fall of Rome. And uh, he imagines them as entering this uh, um, baptistry. And that's the words he uses. He says, if the barbarians were 
dumbstruck at the sight of Rome and her majestic monuments when the Lateran surpassed all other works of man, I, who had come to things divine from man's estate to eternity from time, from Florence to a people just and sane, with what amazement must have been filled. And again, notice the subtleties of Dante's um, choice of monuments. He could have picked any monuments in Rome, but he picked a baptistry because here he's talking about barbarians who will be converted to Christianity, right? So here we have a double transformation. This is not just like a form of like visual enchantment and amazement. Here there's also a form of stupor for the greatness of the Catholic religion. And uh, so Dante is always trying com to convey both aesthetic amazement, but also spiritual regenerations by making references to this monument. And then Dante, when he was in Rome, um, was himself accused of corruption. And uh, he received uh, a first condom. Um, he refers to a first, uh, um, he first received an accusations in January of 1302, and then his accusations was reinstated in March of the same year. And Dante was condemned to exile, which meant all his properties, his house, were confiscated and he could not return to Florence. Dante rejected these accusations. They always, he always said they were not true, but there was nothing he could do. It was part of kind of like the shifting political game of Florence. But the result is that Dante could not return home. So Dante started his journey throughout Italy and he visited many other cities. And his knowledge of the cities contributed to the way he wrote the Divine Comedy because he makes numerous references to it. It's also very helpful because Dante could see and learn about the Florentine politics through the eyes of foreigners and therefore he multiplied his perspective and he could reconsider some of his assumptions about what was going on in Florence at the time. But one of the cities I want to focus on is the city of Lucca. It is not far from Florence, this is in Tuscany, which is a beautifully preserved medieval city still today. You can find it, uh, you can see the city walls on the left. Although at that time, it looked much more similar to Hong Kong than it is today, because it was a city full of tower. Here you find an altarpiece by Baldessaro di Biagio that represents the coronations on the Virgins, but at the bottom you find the representations of the city of Lucca that the Virgin is contributed to protecting, right? And here you get a sense of how many towers must ex have existed in Lucca at the time. And then, but uh, the city is also important because it gets most of its waters and, uh, and from the Sergio River, the Dante also mentions in the Divine Comedy. Rivers at the time were also the highways uh, of medieval Europe. That's how you transport the goods, uh, you know, um, across the territories. You know, transporting goods by horse uh, is very expensive and uh, takes forever. Whereas, uh, you know, um, by boats is much more convenient. So the, the importance of rivers for um, the well being of medieval cities cannot be understated. But Dante in, in, uh, in hell, uh, in Inferno, Canto 21, he's uh, encountering a magistrate from Lucca. And he doesn't give us the name of this magistrate uh, who's being carried by a devil, right? This is like, uh, we're still in the Ballet Bolge, and here the devils are tormenting the singers. They're taking them by the ankles, they're putting them on their back, they're trying to escape, and so on. And as a way to describe, you know, the movements, the difficulties, the pain in which uh, these sinners, the, the, the sinners are going through. And, but also to give clues about the identity of this person, Dante makes specific references to landmarks of, of Luca. 
He says that the sinner plunged, then surfaced, black with pitch. But now the demons from beneath the bridge shouted, the sacred place has no place here. Here we swim differently than in the Sergio. If you don't want to feel our grappling hooks, don't try to lift yourself above the ditch. You can see the references to the Sergio. But you hear Dante is making another connection to an important icon of Lucca. It was the most important religious object in the city. That was held in the Cathedral of San Martino. And it's still today considered the oldest wood medieval sculptures that we have. It represents the holy face of Christ. And it was considered to be an authentic, that is, um, it was considered to be an authentic representations of the likeness of Christ that was sculpted in Jerusalem and then brought to Italy by Italian merchants. So Dante is making reference to this important icon that would have known not just by the Tuscans, but throughout Europe, because they, we have numerous references in manuscripts and in, in poems about this venerable object. In another passage in the canto, is also making references to local cult, that is the cult of uh, a famous woman, Saint Zita, still represented as a mummy in this church in Lucca, that was considered to have miraculous powers. So again, Dante here spent time in Lucca, learned about the local cults, what are famous throughout uh, um, Europe and make specific references to it, again, as a way to make the experience of this imaginary space of hell more concrete, but also because these objects allow him to bridge constantly between, you know, the abstract world of sins, vices, and religion, and the concrete world that he inhabited at that time. Dante makes also references to the city of Bologna, where he may have spent two years and perhaps even studied, although this is unclear. This is more in the north of Italy, as you can find represented here. And Bologna, like Lucca and like Hong Kong today, was also a city kind of filled with towers. We're talking about hundreds of towers, like as thin as spaghettis, because in these cities that were constrained by city walls where you could not live, the only way to expand was by going up. Um, Dante goes to Milan to meet uh, with uh, um, the Emperor Henry VII, with whom he hopes uh, um, Italy could be reunified. And there he talks about the city. Here you find the representations on the left by Pietro del Masaio of what Milan looked like, again, crossed by rivers and canals with specific landmarks that corresponded to the various churches. But he makes, uh, but Dante, we know he went there because he makes references to the imperial crown, a crown that you can still find in the Cathedral of Monza. And it was considered the, the most prestigious crown. And, and by making references to it, Dante refers to imperial power. And then eventually moved to Verona, where he spent most of the times so that we wrote large chunks of the Divine Comedy. In Verona, he found the protections from the Lord of the city, Can Grande della Scala. But most importantly, he found perhaps the most prestigious library in Europe. This was housed in the uh, scriptorium of the cathedral. And you can still visit it today, although the Capital Library of Verona has been refurbished in the 17th century. Libraries were fundamental for Dante's uh, book project. He needed references to important epics, uh, such as Ev Ep Ovid and especially Virgil, who is uh, his uh, guardian and chaperone for the first uh, two um, Cantica. And then, but also the whole Divine Comedy is full of uh, literary, intellectual, and cultural references. So having a great library at hand meant that Dante could uh, double check these references, uh, uh, learn about uh, optics uh, and order scientific branches. They didn't have the time. Uh, well, they couldn't carry with him because Dante, that's the thing, Dante was famous for having a prodigious memories, but, uh, you know, as an 
person in exile, you cannot carry a library with you all the time, just like a, a limited number of books. So he relied on libraries already there, right? Plus a lot of the books were expensive to produce, printing had not been invented yet. So a lot of them were um, simply um, handwritten and were possessions of monasteries or libraries. So they could not be kind of borrowed, for instance. Uh, Verona is also a place uh, that witness to um, Dante's cultural growth. He's really an intellectual. He, he, he takes numerous roles there. And for instance, we even know that Dante's gave lectures there. I just want to flag up one, which is perhaps not that well known. In the Church of St. Helena that you can see here represented, it was also used as uh, basically a lecture hall. Dante gave uh, a talk about uh, the questions uh, I'm translating from Latin, of the water and the earth, which is a first attempt for him to explain his cosmology, you know, how he envisions the universe. And material from that lecture shaped, you know, the way he perceived, you know, hell, purgatory, and paradise in the Divine Comedy. Dante in Verona was eventually joined by his sons, Jacopo and Pietro, who could leave Florence. And Dante, with his two sons, moved to the city of Ravenna, where he was under the patronage and the protections of the Dapolenta family. Uh, we can uh, the, the Dapolenta, in general, every lord is very interested in having Dante in uh, as part of their court because Dante comes with amazing rhetorical skills. He's someone who can speak to the people in power. He's someone who's read Latin, right? Who's incredibly uh, fluent in speech, but also he knows how to speak with the people of powers, what to say, what not to say. And therefore, it's thanks to his diplomatic skills that Dante continues being sought after by all these lords throughout Italy. And for instance, Ravenna is uh, in, in chats with Venice and Dante goes to Venice. Dante, as I mentioned at the beginning, is buried in Ravenna. It's uh, today you can go and visit his tomb that, however, has been built by Camillo Morigia in the 18th century, a local architect. is also responsible for facades of many churches there. And then this is probably the um, house of the Depolenta family. Dante was under the protections of Guido, uh, the second novello. But again, Dante in Ravenda find all the elements that we've seen in Verona and in Florence, because all medieval cities in Italy pretty much constructed around the same ways. He finds a city hall, a place for the political power. He found the cathedral, the center of religious power. He also finds the churches of the mendicant orders, such as the Franciscans. This is the Church of San Francesco in Ravenna, which are learning centers besides incredibly popular um, e ecclesiastical centers. But besides all of this, Dante found in Ravenna something quite unique. And that's where I would like to finish uh, today's lectures and journey through Dante's medieval cities. Ravenna, that is uh, overlooking the Adriatic Sea, is bordered by a beautiful pine forest. And Dante describes this pine forest at the very end of the purgatory, when he needs to describe the Garden of Eden. And that's what he writes. He said, let me read in Italian for once, la divina foresta spessa e viva Caliocchi temperava il novo giorno, which in English translates the heavenly forest dense and living green, which tempered to the eyes the newborn day. Dante uses the pine forest of Ravenna as a way to talk about the Garden of Eden, the most luxuriant uh, place. But it's also, this is like at the beginning of the end of the purgatory, which means that Dante is leaving behind hell and the sinners of the purgatory and is about to enter heavens, which is also a way in a sort of way to mean that Dante is leaving earth, right? So, and um, Dante will end his days in Ravenna, perhaps contemplating this beautiful forest uh, with whom I leave you. Thank you.